Carnegie Mellon University's advanced database systems course is filmed in front of a live studio audience. Right, so this is the last lecture of the semester, um, and we're going to cover Amazon Redshift. And so the challenge of this, this, this lecture is like, you know, I'm not repeating myself because it's a lot of these things are, these systems are doing the, the same thing over and again. But I'll talk a little bit about some of the, the pieces that make Redshift unique uh, separately than the others. I mean, the paper is, was a good paper in terms of like, it covers a lot of stuff, but it doesn't cover a lot of stuff in, in detail, how they do it. It's just like, we do this, 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 and this. So I can talk a little bit about uh, what we know from them. Um, before we get to that, the, um, what's on the, again, the finish things up. Again, the final presentations are going to be next Thursday in this room, 9 a.m. Again, I haven't checked the, what the, the vote tally is, but go vote whether you want, what, what you want for breakfast. Um, and so for this one, again, on the web page, it'll say you need, you need to email me your slides, the final write up for the project, and then this little JSON f uh, file we ask you to fill out. What? Uh, yeah, we'll get there. Well, the little JSON file, uh, like what your name is and, and, and your project GitHub URL and, and everything. And then we use that to generate the, the showcase web page that we then put on the website. And then again, I've had, uh, I've had um, people, you know, former students, like they apply for a job and they, they, the, at a database company, and they contact me and they want to know what you guys did when you were in this class and we have the showcase page, we, we can show them. Um, and also, too, for people like, you know, if you're an international student, you need to get what H-1B stuff or whatever a visa uh, you, want, you want to get later on. Your lawyers will, will reach out to me, ask me to write a letter, say what you did in my class, what the skills you learned. And again, the showcase page helps me remember what you guys have done. All right, so that again, so, so all that's going to be due Thursday morning uh, at 9 a.m. The final exam was going to be due at, at uh, at the same time, and I realized, and I forgot that I tried to do that last year, and it was a bad idea. Uh, so we bumped it now to be Saturday, May 4th at basically midnight. Thank you. Yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I, sh I should have not done it. I should have remembered that I tried to do this last year, it was a mistake. Yeah, so again, the prompt is on, um, is, uh, on Piazza. It's basically saying you have to retrofit a new system, uh, retrofit an existing system, and here's a menu of optimizations uh, that you could potentially do based on the things that we talked about throughout the entire semester, and you gotta pick three. Uh, and you gotta justify why you wanna pick those three over others, including with citations and other information that we've discussed throughout the entire semester, okay? So what is this, again, this is grad school, this is CMU, so there are, how does this, I don't want to say there's, there, there isn't a wrong answer. There clearly are wrong answers. Uh, but like, in, you know, if you're debating, it's forcing you to think about, okay, if I can only pick three, what, what, what is going to be the biggest bang for the buck in terms of getting the, the best performance? Um, and you have to also think about, okay, if I choose one optimization, does that mean, you know, it doesn't actually do anything unless I choose this other optimization. Therefore, I got to choose two together. And that takes away your choices. Yes? Is there something we're specifically optimizing for? Or is it just like... Perf just performance. Just performance. Yes. And you can ignore engineering costs. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Right? Because, again, that's relative. Like, you know, you, you know if, if you don't have any experience in SIMD, oh, that would be very hard versus, like, building the query optimizer, right. which is hard for everyone, actually. Um, yeah, so, again, so, uh, you know, we, we post on Piazza... Uh, if you have questions or additional clarifications. And then also, I haven't posted this yet, we'll post the URL for the Google form you can fill out to say whether you, you use ChatGPT or not. But what does that mean, like, you use ChatGPT and, like, like if you want to take, if you want to co copy the, 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 the question into ChatGPT and say, write me a four-page essay with citations, it, go for well, what it. What if you, like, partially use it? That's fine. That, that, that's an option when you, when you say, oh, okay. right, did I use ChatGPT or not, and then to, to what degree you did. Does it have to be four pages? Is there like a limit? At most four pages. At most four pages. At most four pages. Good. And, and, and again, the justifications can't because, because Andy said it was a good idea, right? It has to be based on the readings, the basic things that we discussed. Okay? All right, and then, uh, I can't spell course, right? Uh, course evaluation, uh, I think uh, we'll send out the reminder emails for everyone, okay? All right, so. Last class, uh, we, we talked about Yellow Brick. Uh, and as I said, it's not a well-known system. 
Uh, it's, it's, but it's, to me, it's very fascinating because like, if you just have really hardcore systems engin engineers on, on your team, you know, the sky's the limit of what you what can do. Uh, and the big thing, as I said, like they're, they're doing all this, they're trying to avoid the OS as much as possible because it's always going to interfere with what the database system uh, wants to do when it, when it executes queries in terms of getting better performance and have the most control. So they basically went around it ent entirely. It's not a true unit kernel where like the, the kernel is n running nothing but the, the database system. Uh, the Germans are actually working on a project on, on, on related to this. But it's about as close as you can get. They, the system boots up, they make 10 sys calls, get everything into user space, and then let the OS only handle like logging stuff or the basic things. Right, again, so I, and I, that's super awesome. Uh, I find it super interesting. I don't know to how m I don't know how much the other you know systems we talked about this semester uh, are doing the similar kind of things. I don't know if anybody's writing their own you know uh, device drivers the way they did. All right, so talking about now Redshift from Amazon. So the background you need to understand is that there is a long history of, of people of, of comp companies and, and open source projects trying to make distributed versions of Postgres. Uh, again, Postgres came out in the 1980s out of Berkeley. It was traditionally a single node system. Uh, in the 1990s, there was a commercial version of Postgres called Illustra, uh, which is a completely separate code base as far as I know. Um, and the original academic version of Postgres didn't support SQL, it supported Quell. And then some Berkeley grad students took the old academic version of Postgres, added SQL to, you know, support to it. And that's why it's called Postgres QL, uh, is the official name. And then as the 2000s came along, people were looking at, you know, try to make it distributed. Um, and so there's a lot of attempts to do this in the OTP side of, side of things. There's Postgres XE, StormDB, which was based on Postgres XE, but then they went under or they got bought by Translattice and Translattice had their own thing. Postgres XL was maybe the one that what people were most excited about uh, and that hasn't been updated I don't think since 2015, 16 or something. All right, so that project basically has died out. Now there's, there's systems like Yugabyte, for example, that, that took the front end of Postgres uh, and then ripped out the bottom half and made that distributed. But it's not, not exactly the same. People were trying to do this you know, natively inside of Postgres. And then there was a lot of systems that were doing this for, for OLAP as well. Again, the mid-2000s is when this really took up. And this is when the first sort of batch of OLAP systems came into place uh, or came, came onto the market. Greenplum we talked about. Citus was uh, based on extensions inside of Postgres. Uh, that got bought by Microsoft. Uh, and Vertica we talked about from Stonebreaker and others. And then ParXL is another one that was try trying to do this. So the ParXL one is, 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 is interesting for us because this is what Redshift is based on. And, and they're completely upfront about this, that this, this is the original history, or this is the lineage of what, what started uh, ParXL. And the sort of the backstory, the rumor is at least that in 2010, with sort of AWS, the cloud you know, offering taking, you know, services taking off, you know, they were looking at adding a data warehouse service that they could include in, in Amazon Web Services and sell it as, you know, as a product. Um, and then they had this big internal debate whether they should just write a system from scratch uh, or should they buy something off the shelf um, and, and use one of those? The problem, though, around this time, uh, all these, I think Citus, Citus just started in 2010, so maybe Citus came a bit later. But like all, there was all these sort of first wave of these, these special purpose OLAP systems, like the Green Plums, Verticas, Park Cells, Astro Datas, um, Data Allegro. All of them had gotten bought up by this point, except for Park Cell. Like Greenplum got bought by EMC, Vertica got, got bought by HP, Data Lego got bought by Microsoft, uh, and then within I think a half a year of looking at the code, they said it was garbage and threw it all away. Um, so they paid you know hundred million dollars for, for something they never used. Uh, Astro Data got bought by Teradata. So Parkcell was the only sort of the last one at the dance, like that hadn't got picked up yet. And so what Amazon ended up doing uh, was instead of buying them. They invested in them, in like their Series E or something like that. And as part of that investment, they got, they got, uh, they got licensed to the source code to use it any way they wanted. Uh, and I think they paid like $20 million for it, which is, again, for how much money Redshift makes now is a steal. Of course, obviously, they put a lot of engineering effort to make it all work. Uh, but to pay $20 million to get the source code versus like Vertica got bought for like $100 million, 
uh, Data Lego got bought for, you know, these are all the like hundreds of millions of dollars. They got it for 20 million. Just, <laughs> kudos to them. Um, so this is what they did. So, and then they, they slapped it up on AWS and then started, uh, you know, selling it as, as a service. Um, I think in 20, I said this is 2014, but I think it was maybe a little sooner. It was right around the same time I think Snowflake came out. So this is Redshift is Amazon's what I'll call flagship OLAP da uh, database management system, or database as a service. And again, the lineage is that it comes from Parkcell, which is a shared nothing uh, fork of, of Postgres. Um, and so you'll see that over time has evolved to a shared disk system. Right? They were, you know, they didn't really start off with like, you know, the way Snowflake did of being completely disaggregated storage. They eventually had to add those pieces back in. Um, and they did it, they tried to do this in a couple of different ways. So they, they added disaggregated storage for S3 in 2017. Um, and then they added recently support for serverless deployments. Basically now I don't need to provision my, my compute cluster ahead of time the way you would have to do in Snowflake, uh, at least an original version of Snowflake, you just say, here's my queries, just throw it right at it. As far as you know, big has always been serverless. Like that one, you've never provisioned, like I want these nodes. You, always, you just say, here's my credit card number, give me a string where I can send queries to. And then if you want guaranteed capacity, you, you sort of pay extra for that. But there's no, no provisioning of, of, of machines. So I would say Redshift is going to be a more, look, what's going to look like a more traditional data warehouse compared to BigQuery and, and Spark that we talked about before, uh, even though it sort of fits in the category, they're always compared with these other uh, data lake or lake house systems, it's going to look more like a traditional uh, data warehouse, similar to Yellowbrick, where they want to control all the data for you. So they're going to add the ability later on to be able to read data off S3 directly, like Parquet files or whatever you have down, down there. Um, but by default, they want to put everything into what they call uh, the Redshift managed, managed storage. So as part of this, uh, the design goal, similar to what Snowflake was trying to achieve, is that they want to remove as much of the, 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 uh, the management responsibilities from the user and have ev everything being controlled as much as possible. And as, as the paper you guys read, they have a bunch of, sort of ML based or automatic based uh, mechanisms to, tr to try to do this. But I, I think the original implementation of it was, it was based, like the very first version of it was like basically Parkcell and you got exposed to all the you know, the internals things about, you know, about Postgres or Parkcell, that they were the things that you had to deal with um, as a user of the service. So what's sort of confusing about uh, Amazon is that there's, there's two different versions of Redshift, uh, and then there's this other thing called Athena, which I don't think the paper mentions, but that's another OLAP system that uh, they support. So the original version of Redshift, I guess I said, I think came out in 2012, not 2014. Uh, and again, that was always being stored in, in you know, that was always, there's a shared nothing system with storing things on the, the compute nodes themselves. Um, then in 2016, they took Presto out of, out of Facebook and then they just rebranded it as Athena. Um, I think it's based on the Trino line now, not the, uh, which is Presto, it was based on Presto Siegel, not the Presto DB1 from, um, that Facebook still controls now. But, they have what they have sort of a, a this would be like more akin to a lake house query engine where you just you, know, you just have a bunch of files on S3 and you can read from it. And again, that's what that's what Presto was originally designed for. And then the Spectrum extension to the original version of, of Redshift came in 2017. And this is basically allowing you to have through the, the Redshift interface or front end query data that's on S3 without having to first import them load them into um, lo load them into the, the Redshift managed storage. So again, so, so when you sign up now, I think you I think you just say I want Redshift and then like if you end up querying data that isn't that you're not gonna suck into the managed storage, that just sort of goes to the spectrum thing. I don't think you specify I want spectrum. Whereas Athena is a completely uh, separate service. And as I said it's just they're just reselling and re repackaging uh, a presto which Amazon does a lot for a lot of, a lot of systems, causes, uh, causes problems with some uh, from database vendors for open source software because Amazon oftentimes makes more money than they do. Um, and, and then, so what ends up happening is these major companies end up relicensing the open source software to prevent Amazon from, from reselling it. Um, so Elastic's probably the, the most famous one that has done this where they had to change the license because Amazon was making more money on Elasticsearch than the actual company Elastic was. 
Okay, so at a high level, this is what Redshift is going to do for us. Uh, so again, a lot of this is going to be the same as the team before. Shared disk, disaggregated storage. Again, even though it started off as a shared nothing, but then they, they switch moved to, uh, to a shared disk. Then we have push-based vectorized query processing. Uh, we'll talk about this in a second, but they're going to be doing intrinsics. Um, you know, AVX2 and Symbian code written by hand by Amazon engineers. What is novel about what they're doing for code generation than the other systems is that they're actually going to do both. Uh, they're going to do the vector-wise style pre-compiled primitives and also do the holistic source-to-source uh, -source, source -source compilation that we, that we saw in HiQ. So they're actually going to be doing both these things. They'll have compute-side caching. Packs columnar storage will be their own proprietary storage. I think they're doing, they can do sort mergers and hash joins. Another interesting aspect is that they're going to have their own sort of hardware acceleration layer, uh, and they're upfront about it, what that, that this is what it's actually doing, where it's like BigQuery, for example, they don't publicly talk about the in-memory shuffle. Um, and, and as far as I know, Snowflake doesn't have anything that they do. And then they have a stratified query, pro, query optimizer. The paper mentions, like, that's how they're going to be able to do, uh, to handle the one-off issues that they have for, query, for queries by having their own sort of rewriter layer. So for today, I'm going to mostly talk about this one and, and, and this one, but then these other things will come up as we talk as we go along. So this is the diagram from uh, from the actual paper itself, um, and you know you, you can see the, all the different p bits and pieces that that make up the overall uh, uh, overarching uh, Redshift system. So at the bottom you have this the, this storage layer here, and what's sort of confusing is that you have sort of S3 here. And then you have this Redshift managed storage next to it. As far as I can tell, they are they're actually you know like EC2 instances themselves, and locally attached storage who can then also you know spill over and write read and write data from the the S3 as well. There's this Aqua thing that that's the hardware accelerator. We'll talk about that in a second. But that could be something that stands in between the the compute nodes and and the, the man, Redshift managed storage. They have these other spectrum nodes here. Uh, again, I think these are just, I don't know if they're like, I understood these things just to be like, it's, it's software that can then run in here in the actual compute nodes or the worker nodes for the running queries that can then just know how to go read data down from, from S3. Um, yes? Two questions. What exactly, so the spectrum is just an isolated thing. Is it actually talking to anyone? This question, this question is, spectrum is an isolated thing. Yes, like there's no error. So this is what I'm saying. I don't. Maybe I'm mis misunderstanding what, what was in the paper. Uh, and when Ippocratus gave a talk last year, I, I don't think he mentioned this. Like, I thought this is just software, because it's just like, OK, you want to read some data on S3? My worker node knows how to go do that, right? From what I understood from his talk this year was that his, his spectrum basically moves stuff from the, so the RMS nodes are just S3 nodes with some more software on there. And like the spectrum moves stuff from S3 to RMS. Is that what so, your question is like, like for the RMS stuff, these are just S3 nodes with the extra stuff. Yes. Yes. And then the... Does that move into that? Into this? Yeah, so like does, it, does it take Amazon S3... No, so I, I thought the spectrum nodes are just... Compu it's just compute, right? Because it's, cause you can join like the RMS data with the, the S3 data, right? Okay. So like, and we'll, talk, we'll see slides in this in a second, but like... And so therefore, like, okay, if you're just doing query processing, that's going to be done up with the compute nodes anyway. So I, I don't know what the separate spectrum nodes are uh, actually mean. Um, and then the, like the compute isolation clusters versus redshift compute clusters. This is just like how you sort of provision it. Do I want do I want to have you know some organization in my in my company have access to a uh, compute cluster that they can only use, and therefore uh, it doesn't interfere with with. It uh, doesn't, doesn't get slowed down if people are sort of going at the general pool for the organization. But they also have the ability to, to scale up automatically if you specify to say, hey, go, go bring some additional nodes, because these things are meant to be stateless. Although I think they also do have a, uh, a local SSD cache as well. And then the compilation service, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But that is basically, again, the, the thing that's going to run GCC to do the transpilation, the, co the compilation of the queries as they go along. And what's also confusing about the, the Redshift managed storage and how it relates to like, compute nodes is when you provision Redshift, you specify you want the uh, instance type to be the Redshift you know, managed storage. And so that almost, 
Sometimes it, the, the literature makes it sound like, okay, well, it's the node itself just knows how to go talk to, uh, sorry, that, that, that you get a single compute instance, but there's also another instance that spins up that has this redshift managed storage versus, as you're saying, is it just something sitting right above S3? Yeah, it, it's, it is S3 nodes with just additional Actually, code. Yeah, additional code, yes. Okay. Okay. So, for, so the, when they execute a query, uh, the actual engine itself is going to be push-based. Um, the example that they show in the paper looks like it'd be pool-based, and they even call this out, but it's, they talk about how uh, you know, that would be too much state to maintain in a, in a, in a pool-based model, that they switch to push-based, but they'd be careful about where they, uh, sort of in, where they do certain operations to avoid blowing out your, your CPU registers. So there's a lot of the same things that we talked about before. Uh, in the hyper paper when they were doing compilation that they're trying to be worried about. But one thing they do differently is that to re help reduce the uh, compilation costs, the compilation time of the queries themselves, that they're still going to rely on some pre-compiled primitives to do vectorized scans and, uh, and filtering and, and other things. So they're not going to do full pre-compiled primitives the way vectorwise was for the entire, you know, the entire query plan. It's just for the lower portions and the leaves, they're going to have things that are, that are the pre-compiled that have been in line into the compiled program. And as I said, the, the code that they're generating uh, is not going to rely on auto-vectorization for any of these primitives. Everything is going to be written by, from hand uh, using intrinsics. Another technique that they, they're going to rely on in these scan loops to avoid stalls is that they recognize that uh, you don't want to do some operation on the tuple you're operating right now and then loop back around in sort of the scan kernel and then face a, uh, face a, stall, a stall because the, the, the next record you want to go uh, retrieve is not in the CPU cache or the CPU registers. So they're going to use software prefetching, which I think we talked about uh, with, with, with vectorization. You basically construct the CPU to say, go fetch this next, uh, these me next memory addresses, bring them into, uh, I think it lands in L3. Uh, or maybe L2, I forget which one, but like basically go fetch the next thing I know I'm going to read from memory into my CPU caches. And they, it's timed in such a way because they control, again, the nodes that they're running on, they're controlling the code that they're generating. So they, they have heuristics to figure out at what point do you want to invoke that software prefetch command so that when you come back around and actually need that tuple, it's actually ready for you. And they basically use a circular buffer to, to place these things. Yes? What is source-to-source source mean over here? Source-to-source source transfer, like the, the query plan is the, the query plan is the source, okay. and then you then you emit a more source code for it, okay. versus like the hyper style was like j taking the query plan, think of the source, and spitting out the, the IR directly. Right. Yeah. Right. So I think we talked this before with with uh, the relaxed oper operator fusion approach, where we were introducing buffers in between in, in our pipeline. There wasn't actually a pipeline breaker; it was like a soft pip pipeline breaker. Right, it's going to fill up a vector, and then once that's full, then move on to the next, the next, uh, the next stage within my, my pipeline. And so the idea was that within that sort of soft pipeline breaker, you would inject the, the, the prefetch commands so that you can do a little bit of work. The, the hardware go fetches, the prefetch is the thing you need, and then when you come back around, uh, the, the data is available for you. Because right? if you think about it, the, if you do too much work, then the the data might get evicted by the next time you start using it. If you do too few work inside the, the, that before you prefetch or after you prefetch, then when you actually then need the data, it's not available. And again, because they're doing all the compilation stuff themselves, they're generating the code, they, they have ways to figure out, I, you know, I'm this far along and therefore I, sh I should inject my prefetch, uh, prefetch commands. So the one thing that also that came out of the paper too is that given from the, all the other systems we've talked about, they appear to be less aggressive in, in being adaptive compared to BigQuery and Snowflake and others, right? Like Snowflake was trying to do uh, aggregate pushdowns. Um, I think uh, Photon and BigQuery were trying to do, figure out on the fly what, what the right you know, data type they should be using. So what they really only talk about is that they have the ability to uh, choose, you know, choose a vectorized implementation of different string functions, like upper, lower, comparisons and things like that. Um, for, what, for when it's ASCII data, and then if that's incorrect, then they fall back to a slower version that operates on Unicode. But that's, that's a, sort of the same trick that the others were doing. Um, 
you know, they're not really reorganizing the query plan themselves. And then the other one they talk about is if you, uh, for the join filter, doing sideways information passing, when you're building the balloon filter on the build side of a hash join, uh, they can recognize that if the, if the hash table is getting too large and, and it's spilling to disk, then you can, you can size the, the balloon filter to be a little bit larger than you normally would because that'll increase the likelihood that you, you don't have false positives um, and, and, you, and you don't end up fetching things from, from disk. But that's really the only two adaptivity parts that they talk about, other than scaling up. But the scaling up thing is, is more like on a per query basis, do I need more compute nodes? Because my current compute nodes are, are running other queries. All right, so the compilation piece of this is, is very fascinating as well. And this is, um, it's similar to what Yellowbrick was doing, where Yellowbrick talked about, uh, instead of having like the worker nodes uh, be responsible for, for compiling the, the queries themselves, Amazon's going to have a separate service that's running on the side with dedicated nodes that to basically call GCC and, and compile things. Um, and the idea is that the, you'll have uh, caching, different layers of caching within, within the system. So you have a local cache where you have pre-compiled uh, query plans or fragments, and if you identify that the, the thing you're trying to compile right now has already been compiled before, you just reuse that. But then they have, have ability, which is, I think, ingenious, uh, to maintain a cache across the entire fleet of machines across all of uh, Redshift. So now, like, the idea is that if, if you come across a query that your cluster has never seen before, it doesn't have the, the compiled query plan in its cache, it can go look in this global cache and see, did somebody else have something that's very similar, and be able to reuse that, that shared object, that pre-compiled, uh, that compiled uh, code. And again, from a, from a security standpoint, there isn't any issue because it's not like there's running, it's running arbitrary user code. It's, it's literally like scan this table on this type with this kind of filter. And so it doesn't matter whether your table contains you know, banking information and my table contains blog information. You know, at the end of the day, a column is a, a data is a column of data and they, they can reuse that. So they talk about how the cache hit rate is like 99.95% for uh, across all queries and across the entire fleet. And then in the cases where if you don't have the pre-compiled uh, segment on your, in your local cache, 87% of the time that when you go to the global cache, it's gonna be in there, right? So this basically negates the cost of compilation, the thing we were worried about before uh, when we are talking about the, the, you know, how to use this technique. And you know, again, when we talked about Haiku and, and, and and MemSQL and other systems that, that fork exec GCC, we talked about how like, you know, it's gonna be seconds to actually compile things. Even Hyper was, was in some cases, it was gonna take you know, hundreds of milliseconds to compile things. All that goes away, because everything's cached. Yes? How big is that cache? This question is how big is that cache? I mean, it's not gonna be petabytes, right? But like, you know, it's probably a couple hundred gigs, sure. But, okay. but who cares, it's your Amazon, right? Like how big, how big is the S3, total amount of S3 storage? I, I don't, huh? A lot, yeah. <laughs> so who cares if you have this cache, these cache query plans, right? And then from their perspective also too, like it's a win-win situation because the customers are f happy because the queries run faster. Uh, it's less computationally expensive to, to you know, fetch something from the cache than, re than recompile it, right? So for them, it's, it's, uh, th this is a no-brainer. And again, this is the, what you can do when it's in the cloud. Like again, if you're running Hyper and it's local on your, on your box, you can't phone home to, to say, you know, do you have this compiled query plan? Because it's sort of not designed that. But when it's a service running in the cloud where you control everything, you can do this kind of trick. So I saw a similar idea from, um, uh, it's a sort of commercial JVM company called Azul, A-Z-U-L. And they now have a compilation as a service, almost similar like this. So like if you're running your Java program, you can have their compiler, the, the local compiler, uh, or the local JVM say, oh, I, I, I want a you know, compiled version of, of this jar file I'm about to run on this, on this hardware. They, they, you can call the service and get you know, cache binaries from them. Um, yes? What I'm most impressed about is that the level of interaction of going to the Less costly than actually compiling. So your statement is you're 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 more impressed that the cost of going to the cache is cheaper than just compiling locally. Yeah, because isn't compiling locally just like ten milliseconds, or uh, and 
milliseconds? Seconds. Seconds, okay. Yeah. Okay. Actually, how large are these precompiled? They like, let's say in like source code lines. Uh, are they more than like a question is how, how 200 lines? Because should, should, like, if it's like precompiled operators, it should, like one operator is not going to be more than like a thousand lines, right? So, so his statement is like, how, how big can these programs actually be? Because like, you know, if it's, because if you're using some pre-compiled pre primitives for certain parts of the lower leaves, but it, you know, what about everything else? Like how, how much that, can that be? It can be in the thousands, right? Like for really big queries with a bunch well, of- they, if they, uh, Sorry, just, just specifically for the pre-compiled primitives. Like, I the pre-compiled primitives are usually pretty tight, yeah, right? those are the small ones. Yeah. So everything else, like- It's all, it's all the, okay. so the, the scaffolding around it that then calls into those pre-compiled primitives. That's what they were, they were trying to avoid compiling that. So what's the point of having the pre-compiled? The statement is, why have the precompiled primitives if you're going to, you know, compre you know be able to compre compile everything? Um, I think the paper talks about how uh, I, they come back and they keep saying that I think it's reduced compilation costs. I mean, yeah, that makes sense. Like, okay. But it, it, it makes, I mean, I think it makes sense because you can imagine, like, um, you, you know, here's this one piece of code that I'm going to keep compiling over and over again. Yeah. At their scale, if you can compile it once and reuse it, I think it, it makes a huge difference. And they talk about, again, there's this overhead of, as we saw before, you know, with, with if the pre compiled primitives, you know, invoking a function is not free at runtime, obviously, because it's a jump call on the CPU. But if you do it on a batch of, of, of data in a vector, then it gets amortized. And, and it becomes negligible. So this would be, I mean, we'll talk about this at the end, but like Amazon's not stupid. Uh, they have all the, the metrics and telemetry up in, across their entire system. Like they can identify, here's the part where we're, we're, you know, here's the part where it's super inefficient for us and they can introduce caching and other things to, to speed things up. So it's not like they designed this because they thought, oh, these, that's fun, let's go do this, right? They did it for a reason. Um, and so like to your point, like, yeah, who cares about compiling the same, you know, same five-line function over and over again? Think of, again, on Amazon scale, you're doing this a billion times a day. That starts to add up. And so the, you know, this probably saves them at the, again, a million, millions of dollars a year to have this. And as I said, like, the customer's happy, too, because like, now queries run super fast, because you're just stitching a bunch of pre-compiled stuff put together. Uh, I don't think the paper talks about this, but I know that you know one of our students worked, did an internship with them and worked on this project. Like, um, they basically keep, they keep track in, in the cache. Like, here's all the source code, and then that that I've ever generated, and they have different compiled versions of it for the different versions of Redshift that they've deployed and the different hardware that's out there. Right? Because Amazon's always putting out uh, new instance types and so forth, um, and put, you know they don't really tell you exactly what the CPU is. That's all hidden from you, but uh, you know they obviously upgrade things over time. So they have the ability to, 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 to have background workers go through, look in the cache, grab the original source code, then recompile it for the, the, the new versions. So it's not, it's not just like for this fragment, here's exactly one binary version. There's additional, um, additional qualifiers you would have to select what version of the binary you wanted. And we saw the same, the same thing with, with yellow brick. All right, so the other thing that the paper talked about, although it's rather short, um, but we can, we can discuss a little bit, is that they have this hardware acceleration layer called Aqua, the advanced query accelerator uh, for, for Redshift. As far as I can tell, this is just for Redshift and not Spectrum, um, right? Because Spectrum is kind of trying to go against directly S3 storage, but I, I might be wrong about this. But basically, they introduced a additional caching, what they call it, what, computational storage layer that sits in, in between the worker nodes and the storage layer that has a bunch of FPGAs that you can do predicate pushdown and aggregation pushdown into these devices uh, and do a bunch of computation on them before you hand it off up to, to the worker. So let's say that like, the worker says, I want to get some data. I don't want, you know, w w with this, this predicate like this. And so the, instead of going talk directly to storage, you go to Aqua and you, you, you say this is the data I want to process. You know, I want to process. Here's the, here's the uh, where clause I want for it, and then this thing goes down to the storage there and, and just makes the the raw get call to S3 or whatever to get it, 
it brings it back into this side, does the, the processing on it and the FPGA, and then shoves it back up to the, uh, to the worker for, for the com uh, computation, right? And the paper talks about how that this layer is not actually tied to the, your cluster, your workers, right? You know, your, your sort of data warehouse instance. This is a, uh, it's a global service that can be reused or multi-tenant across any possible customer. Similar to the compilation service was across all of the, the entire fleet of Amazon Redshift uh, users. Same thing for this, that this was like used by anybody. Um, and they talk about how the, the, one of the advantages of having this additional separation between the storage layer and the, the work layer is that you can down do cluster resizing on the worker, worker level and not worry about having to shuffle things around because this thing is sort of independent of it. I think that's a little bit of them being a remnant or the, the, the artifact of them originally starting off being a shared nothing system. So this was introduced in 2021, uh, which is you know, what, not that long ago, three years ago. Uh, and the paper is 2022, so they're talking about it, but the paper was written in 2021 by the time it came out in 2022. Um, and then I think around 2022, people noticed that you can no longer enable this feature. Uh, and I think the response was, oh yeah, it's just always on. Um, but as far as I can tell, as far as I know, uh, without having to cut anything here, that this was phased out. They actually got rid of this. Um, but they just didn't publicly announce it. And instead what they did was at the, uh, at the storage layer, they have these, um, I think they mentioned Nitro. The Nitro is the, Nitro is not a single thing, but that's their sort of, their, what they call the project of how running their own hypervisor, the specialized hardware that, that they're running for all the, the different instances on, um, on Amazon. And has, they have custom silicon on these Nitro uh, instances to do, do networking, do uh, you know, additional processing for EBS and storing things. And so one of the things that they've added is the hardware acceleration through Nitro, an additional card, to do the kind of stuff that they were doing originally on the FPGA. Right? So the, you know, so this aspect is unique, but this sort of seemed like this was like a, not an afterthought, how to say this, like Snowflake didn't, didn't really do this. It's basically doing trying to predicate push down to the storage. And, but instead of adding much more stuff down here, they just had this extra layer in the middle. Yes? Dremel does this as well, right, before it's shuffled? With, with FPGAs? Yeah, you said it in the lecture. Dremel? As in BigQuery. Oh, BigQuery, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. Oh, no, sorry, I, I, said, I thought you said Dremio. No. Yeah, sorry, Dremel, yes. Uh, but that's like on the shuffle nodes themselves, not like the storage layer, right? I think what Amazon has done is push this kind of stuff down into the, the storage layer down here. And so instead of having a, a separate standalone service, which this, which this was, it's all not, now just down here. Right, you can see this with, with S3, like you, you, they have an S3 select uh, API, like you can basically do where clauses on S3 independent of, of uh, Redshift. And I suspect that's how they're relying on the same kind of mechanism. But there wasn't really a big announcement. This Aqua just sort of, you know, sort of just disappeared as far as I can tell without acknowledging that it's been removed. All right, so for the query optimizer, again, they don't really say much. Um, other, I know that it's still based on, you know, it's always been, been, been heavily modified over the years, but it's still heavily based on you know, Postgres' query optimizer. Um, so it's gonna be a bunch of, of heuristics and rules in the very beginning to do some rewriting uh, as part of what this, this piece down here does. And then they're gonna do some kind of cost-based uh, uh, search to figure out the like, optimal join ordering. Um, and again, unlike in, in Dremel and unlike in, um, in Databricks where they assume they're not gonna have query statistics, in the case of a Redshift, if it's on, if it's on Redshift managed storage, they, they'll run Analyze and collect the data and, and you know, train, build statistical models that then feed into the cost-based optimizations. For Spectrum queries that are running after raw data, going after raw data on S3, as far as I can tell, the only thing they can do is go extract the, um, the, the, the metadata in the headers or footers of Parquet and Orc files and try to push down filters based on, on those zone maps. 
like you know basic min max clauses and things like things like that. And I think that gets cached up into the the in the compute layer. So you're not going always going to read, reading S3 for every single file. The paper makes a big deal about this query rewriting framework, QRF. Again, they aren't describing what it actually is. As far as I can tell, there's no documentation about it because again, it's this internal thing. Uh, but they talk about how it's a DSL-based approach where you can basically specify the patterns that you're looking for and then the transformation rules if you match a pattern, which is what we've been talking about you know, all before for query optimizers is basically how they work. But they claim that their, their implementation of it, their, 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 their method of doing this is really easy for, for anyone to come along and uh, you know, extend it. They, they mentioned interns could use it in three days or get it working in three days or make changes in three days. So this sounds like what the yellow brick people were talking about in the last class, where they, rather than make, making you know, principal changes to the, the, in, the internals of the query optimizer and how it actually wants to do searches and enumerations and other things, that they have these sort of one-off rules where they try to patch things up for queries as they come in based on, you know, to, to sort of force the, the, the query plan in, in the form that they want it. So another interesting thing that they, that, um, that Amazon does, and their documentation for Redshift is actually really, really good. They have a whole documentation page on how to make queries run faster, especially running on, uh, on Redshift, again, where you don't have statistical information. So they have a bunch of guidelines. I'm not going to read them all. Um, but like, they talk about how, OK, well, if you know you're running on a star schema, then you should put your fact, fact tables in S3 and all your dimension tables in, in Redshift Managed Storage, because in that case, you can at least get statistics from the Redshift Managed Storage data. And then you know, that's a, you know, the, their optimizer will be smart enough to recognize, OK, well, that should maybe be where I'm going to build all my hash tables. And I just have this giant pipeline where I probe, it, probe all those hash tables with my, my fact table. Or they talk about how like, you should write your queries in a certain way that you know that these things can be pushed down into, uh, into the storage layer based on them being simple and whatnot. You can actually also define statistics on these external tables or S3 tables. And that, I think, what happens is Amazon then goes and reads that data in, collects the statistics, and then stores it as if it was a regular table. So I find this kind of interesting. This is like they, it's like telling you what, you what you should be doing as a user to deal with the fact that you may not have any statistics on, on S3 data and try to preempt uh, you know, preempt any problems that come later on. All right, so we've talked about, about this already, uh, the red, red from managed storage. Again, as I said, I, I think it's separate nodes. As you said, they're running on SS3, or sorry, S3, and they're going to have local uh, attached SSDs that if they then fill up, then they spill to, spill to S3. So that's why I don't think they're pure S3 nodes. I think they're separate like easy, not easy to do instances because they're, they're controlled, but I, I think it's something separate. That's just my understanding. And I think the compute nodes also have their own uh, local SSD cache as well. But when you put things in, in, in Redshift managed storage, that's not, it's not going to be using Parquet. It's not going to be using an open source file format. It's going to be using their proprietary format. Again, similar to what we saw in Snowflake, Yellowbrick, uh, and others. Yes? Yes, so what she said was for, for Spectrum, it, is, it has the ability to read data on S3 in any possible format uh, and then feed that data into the regular Redshift compute nodes. Yeah. But again, my, going, going back to my original point, I don't think they're separate nodes. I think it's just the same compute nodes. Uh, and as the Redshift uh, compute nodes, like the worker nodes yeah. Redshift? Uh, no, Do you, you have to... You, 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 okay, you have separate notes. You have to provision. You pay for them. You provision them separately. Uh, they get provisioned. Uh, it, it's it is transparent, but it's more of a based on your query pay as you go. Okay. Through the thing. Okay. So that's compute. Okay. Yeah. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, again, because again, with, they want to manage everything. So when you when you create a table schema, that they're gonna you can specify exactly what compression schema and coding schema you want to use. 
Uh, these are just, just a sample of them. And then they, ha they talk about how their, they have their own proprietary one called AZ64 that they claim is, you know, gets comparable compression to something like Snappy, uh, but, it, but, it, but it's faster. But as far as I know, there's no public documentation that talks about it. There's, I'm sure there's a patent, but we don't, we don't want to read patents in academia. So it's for uh, plausible deniability. Wait, they're bad or? Patents? Yeah, like why? Yeah, you don't want to read patents. I didn't get why. Uh, so if you're a researcher, don't read patents, because then if you, if you end up inventing the same thing, they can't claim that you told, sold their ideas because you didn't read the patent. Right? It prevents you from certain, you know, from maybe reselling or do, doing it, you know, monetizing it, but it's not, it won't, it isn't like this I have to cut. Uh, what was the point of the story? Don't read patents. There you go. That's, that's the point of the story. Um, okay. So, uh, here's the, uh, here's the, 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 the paper. Uh, sorry, here's the graph in the paper where they show here how much faster things are. Um, so this is running TPCDS on three terabyte uh, data set. And so they have what they call the out-of-box experience, meaning like you just, you just bulk load some data and then immediately run your queries at it. And then here's the performance you're getting relative to Redshift. And then the, the tuned one is like if you actually go maybe add indexes, add compression properly, actually spend time to actually tighten things up, uh, here's, here's what you can do. Everybody says they're the best. <laughs> so the, so the, I reading a series with four papers, and, and they all have a figure that says, look, we're better than everybody else. Yes. <laughs> well, this is what I said. So we, we showed Yellow Brick last time, right? Yeah. Uh, completely different. Right. So, I mean, so Yellow Brick is faster. This, Yellow Brick's not in here, but, like, they, Yellow Brick had, Snowflake always had, as, as being a number two, right, I think. Um, but Re Yellow Brick had, had, I think, Redshift slower than. Uh, Snowflake as well. Yeah, Snowflake as well, yes. Yeah. Wasn't, it, wasn't it worse than BigQuery as well? Yeah. Yes. It was, yeah. Yeah. You know, what's funny is this time it was even less accurate because they're just doing TPCDS runtime than one, two, three, four. <laughs> it, it, no, it's, it's, sorry, it's relative to Redshift. Sorry. Yes, they didn't actually give numbers, they just give Redshift yeah. to us. So that's what I'm so, <laughs> so, so I think it's important. Like, it's, it's rare to see absolute numbers in there. Just because, again, you don't want your competitors using your own numbers against you. So maybe this is, say this is actually legitimate, right? Um, and maybe, you know, I'm not saying it's not legitimate. I'm just saying, like, there's so many different factors. But say, you know, Snowflake really was slower, and then they add new features right. and to get, it, get this number down. So now they can point to say, you know, Redshift got this, and we got that because we added this new feature. Right, so they want to avoid all that. And they said, Yellow Brick, that paper is great because they put raw numbers in. Yeah. No one does that. Uh, but there's no way like Amazon legal is going to let you put anything out like that. So again, I, I hopefully, again, you guys are, are skeptical. It sounds like everyone is, which is good, about like what these numbers actually mean and are they actually you know, are they telling us anything. Other than to say, like, despite all their efforts to make everything be uh, serverless and try to remove the, the the, the need for a human to come and, and tune things, you know, it, clearly it makes a difference. Right? Again, this number is not this number. Right? These, are, these, are, these are two separate you know, baselines. Um, but like, you know, going from this to this for, for uh, BigQuery, that's a pretty big drop. Because right? I can't imagine the other ones got, got significantly slower. And, and you know, BigQuery is just the same if you're tuning. Yes? So when I see data like this, Redshift is really good with large data sets with complex queries like TPCDS, or should I say, oh, maybe it's the relative scale that I should think about? Like, well, what should I take away from this? So it goes back to that, I think, that Reddit post I shared before. The question is, what, how, what, what should be your, your takeaway from this? Um, it goes back to the, that Reddit post where I said before, like, you can simplify a decision. Like, if you already got a bunch of data on Amazon S3, then you probably just be easier to use Redshift. Right, or something that can you know, access the raw files. Um, the, if you're a company where like, you know, it's, your, it's your job or responsibility to figure out what, you know, which one you can use, and money it, and, and location of what cloud platform you're going to use is not an issue, you just don't like, look at this and say, oh, I'm going to use this. There's the whole process where you do a POC. They, they have solution architects help set up your cluster. Like if, if, you know, if you're signing for millions of dollars of you know, years of service, right? because you're also not paying monthly, you're paying like, you're prepaid ahead of time to get a discount. 
So you have like solution architects that help you know set up your the environment, help take a sample of your workload running on whatever you know software you have now, data system you have now, and then they'll run experiments for you and give you feedback. So it's it's for you as a student who don't, you know, I don't know you. I'm assuming you don't have any money, but like, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I know I'm seeing your costs. Uh, <laughs> so uh, anyway, so, so so like for you as as a student, like, uh, honestly, again, simplicity is what I would I would I would aim for. Um, as we said before, you can cook the you not cook the books, but like they can add a bunch of query rewriting rules, then they say, oh, it's TPCDS, make it do this one, make it do this one trick because I know that's going to make make a huge difference in performance. So you got to take all this with a grain of salt. The Nobody's going to be making major, at, at a sort of corporate level, enterprise level, making major decisions about choosing one over another based on like benchmark results like this, right? This is just for them to brag in the paper, like the word faster. Right. So yeah. what is it they're comparable, and that's it, right? Uh, comparable in terms of what? Like they're all comparably fast, so you can pick the one that best suits you. That's the point. Yeah, I, I, my, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this in a second. Yeah, that, that's my end. My end. My end. My sort of including, including remarks for the semester is exactly as you said. Given that you know, here's all the optimizations that I can do. We saw through the last couple, couple of weeks how they're, they're all doing vectorized execution. They're all mostly doing push-based stuff. They're all doing some either pre-compiled primitives or, or, or you know, holistic query compilation. They're all doing what you should be doing to, to get a high-performance OLAP system. Quick question. Redshift only does the primitives, right? It doesn't do the holistic. Full no, they, they, do, they do both. That's the whole thing. They co-gen C++ that, 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 that where they inject the pre-compiled primitives into it. Right? That's unusual. Nobody else does that as far as I know. Right. Yes? From a business point of view, I think you understand why Snowflake and Databricks are like, that successful. Because Redshift, uh, Snaps, and BigQuery, like, they're all based on cloud providers, right? Yes. So Snowflake doesn't have that. So, so how, well, how, yeah, good question. So his question is like, how can Snowflake be successful as it is yeah. when it's competing against Microsoft, the Googles, and, and the Amazons? And the answer is because they got there early. So as I said, in 2012 or 2013, when they, when they, they put out Redshift, it was basically Park Cell slapped up on there. And the idea was, and Amazon's famous for this, they put it up there. If no one uses it, yeah, we'll just take it down. No big deal. If people start using it and they start making money, then they throw more money into it and make it better. Right? So, but Snowflake came out of the gate probably getting, like if you compare 2013 Snowflake or 2014 Snowflake versus you know, 2014 Redshift, Snowflake was probably faster. I can't prove it, but I'm, this is pure speculation. Um, and, but over time, you know, Amazon threw a ton of money in it to do all this extra stuff and make it faster. But like, Red, Snowflake was at the right place at the right time and early enough that there, there wasn't any other competition. So that's, that's why they were able to, to succeed and grow as much as they did. So now you may say, okay, well, what about the, the Clickhouses, the Dremios, the, the, the Druids, Pinos, all these other ones that, that like are coming, coming to the party a little bit later? Um, you know, how are they going to compete against the, uh, you know, against the, the, the giants and the incumbents like Snowflake? Um, it's, it's hard. It's an uphill battle. You just got to figure out what the, you know, it's, it's up to these companies to figure out, like, what's sort of one thing that they think they can do much better than what, you know, the, the, the big queries of the world can, can do. Because it feels so hard, right? I guess it is hard, yes. Correct, yes. This well, David is like, <coughs> say you have this amazing new idea, like how are you going to, can Amazon just you know, throw a ton of money at and implement it? Yes. Yeah. Now, big companies, they're, they're giant ships. It takes a while to like, you know, to move things, right? This is sometimes called the innovator's dilemma. Like, it's, you're making so much money on what you currently have, which, you know, at the time maybe state of the art, and then something new comes along, and, but it radically changes what you, what, how you approach things. You know, you're not really incentivized to go make that change, and therefore the upstart can come, come and come beat you. That's basically what Snowflake did, right? Oracle already had, and Teradata already had cloud, or sorry, not cloud version, they, they already had like enterprise grade OLAP systems that they could have sold on the cloud, but they were making so much money on prem that, you know, they didn't, they didn't invest in that maybe early as they should have. Teradata is probably the, the best example of this, right? Or DB2 is another one. Um, so, this is what I was maybe seeing also earlier in the semester too, that like 
all that systems now more or less have become the core engine, the kind of things we talked about in the China semester, they basically come commoditized. And now you have something like Velox or Data Fusion where like you can get a high performance OLAP you know, execution engine uh, out of the box you know, you know, free and then you sort of build something around it to, to then you know, run queries and do other things. And so what makes maybe Snowflake unique in 2013 you know, is, isn't enough anymore and it's all about the user experience, it's all about how good the query, plan, uh, query planner is. Um, you know, how well can you read data in S3 uh, with, you know, without requiring users to do a bunch of extra stuff. Like those are the, they're, they're harder to measure from a, from a sort of a scientific objective because there's like, you know, qualitative aspects of, of the, the system. But I think those are going to really matter a lot. I would say, so the one area where you see like the Pinos and others trying to differentiate from these other guys is that, you know, this is not really meant for run real-time queries. Like if I ingest data, you know, I want to be able to get Query it like almost immediately. That you're not really not going to be able to do that with these these systems that well. Um, and so there's these what they'll call real real time OLAP systems, where they're either doing heavy indexing, something like Rockset does this, Pino does this, or you're doing uh, automatic materialized views. This is what Materialize does. So there's there's systems where upon ingestion of the new data, you're building some additional data structures that then let, you can then query almost immediately, in a way that you can't really do with these sort of these these traditional OLAP systems in the cloud. But Snowflake's not dumb. They know people want to do that. So they're, they're adding their own kind of stuff to take care of these things. All right? So that, that's, you know, it's hard, you know, again, it's hard to, to, to measure, you know, how, how good someone's experience with a system is versus another without, because you have to talk to humans, and humans don't know what they're doing. Um, <laughs> and so the best you can really do is with all performance numbers. So as I was saying, with Redshift, this is a good example of like a system that has evolved organically over the time because you know, we maybe started off as a sort of a shared nothing system, even though things moving into the cloud was, was we, as we talked in the entire semester, you want to be disaggregated storage. Um, but then they, they've changed their, their architecture and add additional features based on what they're seeing. And again, they collect telemetry on everything. Every single query, they collect telemetry, all the users' patterns, and they analyze it to figure out here's the things that they, they need to optimize, or here's the things that can, they can make things run better. I don't know if the paper talks about this, but um, Ippocratus gives this example all the time, the guy, the CMU alum who, uh, who works on Redshift now, that they looked at their telemetry and saw that update queries were actually running really slow, and there was a lot of them, which is not something you would think about if you're trying to build like an OLAP system, right? Because you think of mostly read-only data. So they, they then went ahead and optimized o uh, update queries, and that made a huge difference and you know, reduced their costs and made their customers happier. And they can do that because they have the telemetry. So going back to this compilation of service or, or this Aqua thing they added, they didn't add it because they thought it was cool. It had a bunch of FPGA sitting in the closet that they, they had to get, get rid of. They did it because they saw the, 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 the measurements from the data they've collected, like this is the bottleneck. Let's go try to you know, add a new component, add another layer to, to make things run faster. Right. And that's, that's the, you know, that's another again advantage of being in the cloud where you see everything versus on-prem where you, you throw it over the firewall. Hopefully somebody then comes back with a report and says this is what this is what ran slow. Yes? Since we're at the end of the almost course, I have a question. Yes. Why is it that all the academic papers were looking at deep C H and all of these industries were looking at deep C E S? His question is why are all the academic papers looking at T P C H and what and why all the uh, commercial systems using T P C D S? Uh, I was saying, so TPCH is obviously easier to get up and running. It's 22 queries, whereas the TPCDS is 11, or sorry, is 100 queries. Um, and there's CTEs and things like that. So, I mean, the Germans can run TPCDS. I don't know what they report numbers, um, but the the amount of the the amount of work you have to do to get TPCDS running versus TPCH is much higher. Because you got to do CTEs. I don't think it's any window functions in TPCDS. It's it, you got to make the query optimizer better. It's a higher bar from an academic standpoint to get it up and running. A, a classic, another example would be if for on the OLTP side, there's TPCC, that's from 1992, right. and then there's TPCE, that's from 2006, that's supposed to be the successor to TPCC. But nobody runs TPCE, actually nobody in the commercial side usually runs it too, because it's a pain in the ass to actually write the code and get it up and running. And everybody, everybody just runs TPCC. Uh, I would think it's, so I think it's just from a complexity of getting the thing actually running. 
There's a lot of open source implementations up for TPC DS as well, but for TPC E, there's nothing. There's not much. I think so. Yeah, I, I think it's just complexity of that. All right. So as I said in the beginning, Amazon makes billions, the B, uh, on on Redshift each year, right? They don't report this publicly, but I think AWS makes it's like it's, I think it's 100 million, sorry, 100 billion a year. And I know that Redshift, is, was, as the paper talks about, was the, the fastest growing uh, service that they added in, in AWS. That, I think, got replaced by Aurora. Uh, then that was the, the, the newest, fastest growing one. Um, and for all this ML stuff, I don't know what happens happening there. But they're making a ton of money on Redshift. But like Parkcell, they got acquired by Actian uh, in 2013 for not much. And then Actian then rebranded it as this thing called Actian Matrix. Uh, but then they killed it off in 2016. So as I said in the beginning, Amazon bought the license to, to, to Park Cell for maybe 20 million, and they're making billions per year off of it. Now again, there's, there's obviously hardware costs, there's labor costs to build this, uh, but I would say from their perspective, that was, a, that was cutthroat. Uh, that, was, that was a gangster move on their part. Um, who here has heard of Actian? Nobody. Nobody. Actian is what Ingress became, or so Ingress is. So Ingress went public in, again, Ingress is the, one of the first relational systems. It's before Postgres. They went public in, in the 80s, got bought by Computer Associates, got handed off, passed around over a couple of years. They end up being like a new holding company that they then changed the name from, Actium, from Ingress to Actium. And then now they basically buy up a bunch of uh, these, these databases that are kind of in maintenance mode, uh, Park Cells in one of them. They actually bought Vectorwise. Um, that wasn't a maintenance mode. That was actually, I think they were actually trying to do something real with that. But they, they bought Pervasive. They, they buy a bunch of these older databases and they sort of milk the maintenance fees. And then they got bought by another holding company out of India. Um, and so they still sell Ingress. I think they, I don't know whether they call it, I think they still call it Ingress. I might be wrong. But anyway, so Park Sale, again, sold off for 20 million. So sold the license for 20 million. I don't know how much they got bought for, but I don't think it was, was that much. And then, it, and then it died. And then Redshift lives on. Again, a lot of money in databases. All right, so that's it for the semester. Uh, this has been fun having you guys. Uh, this is the first semester where we've only had uh, one person drop the entire semester. Um, and it wasn't for, uh, you know, for reasons outside of their control. Um, so again, appreciate everyone being here. Thursday, next, next week, we'll do the final presentations. It will be random order this time. Um, <laughs> you know what that means for us. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, random's random, okay? Uh, and then I would say I didn't pick Redshift. I didn't pick Redshift last for any reason because it was like you know the greatest whatever. I didn't think it just covers a bunch of stuff that that, that we've already covered, um, and I want to make sure I include it because it's you know it's a, it's a large system. Um, I I don't have office hours today because I, I got to head to the airport. Uh, but send any send any me emails if you want to talk personally this weekend. Um, or send me emails about like you know you want additional information about, about your uh, what your presentation should be, and then the final exam again the PDF is on Piazza. Uh, if you have any clarification questions, post that in the in, in Piazza below. Okay. All right, guys. Good luck with the rest of your classes. See ya. Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't it no puzzle I guzzle 'cause I'm more man. I'm down in the forty and my shorty's got four cans. Stacks and six packs on the table And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label No shorts with the cloth, you know I got them I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom Throw about three in the freezer so I can chill it Careful with the bottle, baby, oops, don't spill it Cause St. Isles is said, the paint is red You drink it down with the guys, it'll rise head Take back the pack of duds You go get you some St. Isles and drink it to the suds Billy D is the chili cheese, so down with the weak guys Be a man and get a can of St. Isles